Well, let me take a minute. Uh, my name is Cliff Boucher and I serve Tyler Junior College as the Dean for Engineering, Math and Science. Um, it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to welcome everybody. So welcome. Uh, we are here to celebrate Darwin Day, our Darwin's birthday. Um, Tyler Junior College has uh, been serving the Tyler community for a lot of years since 1926. And during that time, we have uh, slowly evolved into a community college. Uh, we offer a lot of different things besides just transfer, transfer courses. Uh, but in that regard, one of the things that we do, and we do it very well, is STEM. Uh, whether it's biology, it's physics, it's chemistry, uh, we really spend a lot of time focusing on students, making sure that they're ready to move on. And the, the, the love of life science, I'm a biologist. I've, I've studied microbiology as a career. And uh, one thing about biology and that we all have in common, chemistry and physics, et cetera, is, is uh, the love of Darwin. And I'm really excited that everybody's joining us. It looks like we have over 200 people uh, here in attendance. And I really hope you enjoy it. I'm glad that, uh, I wish we could be here in person uh, for a lecture, but uh, given the circumstances, we'll, we'll enjoy the Zoom. And with that, thank you for being here. And let me turn this over to Dr. Tom Hooten. He uh, currently serves as our chair for engineering and physics at Tyler Junior College. So Dr. Hooten. All right, thanks Cliff. Am I good? Everybody hear me? All right, excellent. Uh, well, hello again, everyone, and uh, welcome to tonight's uh, Darwin Day 2021 talk. Uh, my name is Tom Hooten, and I am the chair of the Department of Engineering and Physical Sciences here at Tyler Junior College. And it's my job tonight to tell you a little bit about Darwin Day and why that is a thing in East Texas of all places. Uh, but first, I want to recognize a couple of people and say thank you to those who planned this year's Darwin Day event. Uh, this includes uh, Danielle Pritchard and Doug Parsons, who are your Zoom moderators for tonight, and uh, the various entities at Tyler Junior College and UT Tyler that have helped make this event possible. So thank you all for your help and your support. And now let's address that question, what is Darwin Day and why are we all here? Well, Darwin Day is an international event. It's held worldwide each year and it's designed to celebrate uh, the scientific accomplishments of Charles Darwin and to promote science in general. And it's held every year on or around the birthday of Charles Darwin, uh, which is February 12th. And this year would be his 212th birthday. Uh, Darwin Day in its current form has been around since the 1990s, although you can trace the history of Darwin Day uh, back to events that started after Darwin's death in 1882. Uh, but here locally in East Texas, Darwin Day has been a part of the TJC Science Center since about 2010, and it has grown every year since. Uh, this year we have well over 300 people registered for this Zoom event, and currently it looks like there are 220 uh, participants right now. Uh, in 2015, Darwin Day in East Texas changed a little bit and it, be and it became bigger. It became a joint effort between several of the science educational institutions in the area, which included uh, the University of Texas at Tyler, uh, their departments of biology, their department of uh, social sciences, uh, Tyler Junior College School of Engineering, Math and Sciences, the TJC Science Center, uh, the Discovery Science Place, and also through grant support the National Science Foundation. And you can find more info about Darwin Day at the Darwin Day website, which is darwindaytyler.org. Uh, this year, for the first time, uh, the Darwin Day Science Lecture is being presented via Zoom. And during the talk, everyone is muted, uh, but we will be taking questions at the end. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand in the chat at the appropriate time. And we will try to address those in order and allow you to unmute yourself for your question. Now, alternatively, if you don't wanna do that, you can type your question in the chat and one of the moderators will read it aloud. Also, uh, tonight's talk is being recorded and it will be available after the event 
and the link provided through the darwindaytyler.org website. Okay, well now let me introduce Dr. Lance Williams. He is the chair of the Department of Biology at UT Tyler, and he will introduce tonight's speaker. Lance. Thank you, Dr. Hooten, for the introduction. Um, welcome to the lecture on behalf of UT Tyler and um, in the biology department. And it's my pleasure today to introduce one of my faculty members, uh, Dr. Josh Banta. Uh, Dr. Banta is an associate professor in my department. Um, he's an evolutionary biologist and has been conducting evolutionary research for over 20 years. Josh um, has put an impressive number of grants uh, together since his time at UT Tyler, around $1.5 million in grants from places like the National Science Foundation, the Army Research Office, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, several foundations. Um, his work has been published in a lot of great journals like Proceedings at the National Academy of Science, Nature, Nature Communications, Heredity, PLOS Genetics. Um, Josh did his undergraduate degree at the University of Pittsburgh and his graduate work is from UT Knoxville and Stony Brook University. His Midway through his PhD, his uh, advisor changed jobs and um, Josh went with him to Stony Brook University where he finished his PhD in ecology and evolution. Um, Josh did his postdoc for three years at uh, NYU uh, before he interviewed here and began teaching for us and we hired him in 2011. Um, Josh has worked on a, a wide group of organisms since he came to UT Tyler. He, he came here as a, as a plant biologist but he, we quickly dragged him into working with, with uh, mussels and other organisms, snakes, a variety of organisms. Um, Josh has published um, on, we've published together on several papers um, and other collaborators. Uh, in 2015, Josh organized a symposium on evolution in Brazil from speakers from all over the world. Um, and related to today's talk, actually, uh, Josh has published about the evolution of human cranial anatomy. So he has a very diverse uh, portfolio and um, it's just my pleasure to introduce him and I look forward to your talk, Josh. Dr. Banta, turning it over to you. All right, well, thank you, Cliff, Tom and Lance and thank you to TJC for hosting, uh, especially to Danielle Pritchard and Doug Parsons for uh, running tech and, and for organizing. Uh, it turns out that it's a good thing that we're doing this online because the weather is a little nasty tonight. Uh, so we can all still be together without being on the treacherous roads. I love giving this talk because uh, it hits a nerve. It's something that we're all interested in. People have been wondering where we came from for as long as there have been people. And that's true within the discipline of evolutionary biology, even back at its original origins with Charles Darwin. Uh, Darwin himself pondered where humans came from and hypothesized uh, an African origin to our species, which by the way, turned out uh, to be correct. And so this talk is going to be about where we come from and uh, some of the other people that we met along the way. I last gave this talk three years ago uh, as a uh, keynote lecture for Darwin Day here in Tyler. And uh, I'm giving this talk again, but if you've seen this before three years ago, uh, you're in for some surprises because there are some really cool updates uh, that I have for you, which is another reason I was very excited to give this talk. So the way I would like to start this off is by showing you this very familiar image of different fossil finds of early hominin species and modern humans. We're used to seeing them aligned as a progression that we started out as, a, as, a, as one of the Australopithecus fossils, then we became Homo habilis and then Homo erectus and then we became Neanderthals and then modern humans. And that is actually not accurate. The, the fossil finds that we have of uh, different species of 
uh, humans as well as earlier uh, hominins are not our direct ancestors. Very likely they are our cousins. It's very unlikely that you would find a direct ancestor of us in the fossil record. It's much more likely that you're going to find a side branch and that's because evolution is bushy. Evolution is like a tree. And so there's a group that we recognize from us and from our relatives in the fossil records that are known as hominins. And this includes our closest relatives in the genus Homo, as well as some more distantly related relatives in the genus Australopithecus. But the important thing to note here, so here's us. In, so we, we are in the hominids within the hominins. I know they sound very similar. Here's us. And notice, for instance, here's Neanderthals. Notice that in this view, you don't see, ne you don't see us evolving from Neanderthals because, it, because we did not. Uh, Homo Neanderthals are a sister group to modern humans. And uh, Neanderthals uh, did not evolve directly from the fossil representatives we have of Homo erectus. But, and, 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 and so let's start off by meeting Homo erectus. This is where I, I want to start because this is the most successful human species that has ever existed by a lot. Homo erectus was around from about 1.9 million years ago up until about 200,000 years ago. That's about eight and a half times longer than humans have been around on the earth. And Homo erectus were found not only all throughout Africa, but all throughout Eurasia as well. And these are uh, some, some various artists' renditions of what Homo erectus may have looked like uh, based upon the fossils. And, and we believe based upon the diverse Homo erectus fossils that Homo erectus was a very diverse species. To give you some more flavor about Homo erectus and how we came to learn about it, I'm going to take you to the island of Java in Indonesia in the late uh, 19th century. And that's where a anthropologist, a Dutch anthropologist named Eugene, Eugene Dubois was searching for the origins of modern humans. And at the time, the favored hypothesis was that modern humans originated somewhere in East Asia, in this very region where Eugene Dubois was looking. And this is despite of the fact that Charles Darwin, a few decades before, had posited that the origin of modern humans was actually in Africa. And he ended up being right. But even though uh, Eugene Dubois was wrong, it, it led him to discover the first recognized fossils of Homo erectus. And based upon the fossil, st the, the strata that these fossils were found in, the age of these specimens was somewhere between uh, 1.5 million and half a million years ago. At the time that uh, Dubois operated, there was not refined techniques for getting a more precise estimate, but that still gives you an idea. Uh, and so we, we, we had some leg bones and some pieces of the scalp and a, and a couple of teeth. But it was clear based upon the anatomy uh, that, that this was not from a modern human. And, and, and so at first that, that appeared to confirm that modern humans originated in, in, East, in, in Southeastern Asia and that this Homo erectus find was a, a direct ancestor to modern humans that later evolved out of Homo erectus in that area. But what we know today from a much more richer uh, uh, variety of fossils of Homo erectus is that Homo erectus actually did originate uh, in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. And we know this in part because of an early Homo erectus find in Eastern Africa called Turkana boy that was discovered by the famous paleontologists, the Leakies back in 1984 in the Turkana Valley in Kenya. Uh, we estimate that Turkana boy was about eight years old when he died, and it's a remarkably complete skeleton. And the date of this skeleton uh, was more precisely dated to uh, uh, 1.5 million years ago. And we have other evidence of Homo erectus going back several hundred thousand years earlier within Africa. The, the species Homo erectus is the first human species, and I'm going to use this term human because we're talking about members of the same genus as us. So we're talking about very closely related species. And Homo erectus 
would have been a species that you would have recognized as being a fellow human, although it would have looked a bit different. So uh, Homo erectus was, was similar in height to modern humans. Uh, it was within the, the same range of heights as modern humans. Uh, their brain was a bit smaller. It was on the lower end of the range of variation that we see in, in, in the size of modern human brains, but it was still a, a very large brain uh, a hominid. Uh, it, it, had some, it, it had some other interesting adaptations. So Homo erectus had shorter arms, similar to our arms, as you can see in the image. And this was a change from from earlier uh, members of the Homo genus and the earlier Australopithecus genus, where the arms were longer, uh, suggesting that there was still somewhat of an adaptation to trees, whereas Homo erectus had shorter arms and had longer legs in, in line with us and in line with uh, adaptation for walking and running for long distances, for instance, in traveling long distances to hunt prey which very nicely lines up with the fact that Homo erectus, shortly after they show up in the fossil record, had spread all throughout Africa and Eurasia. And I just want to point out some differences in the skull. You're going to see the, this general skull shape show up a lot in my talk today. So Homo erectus differed from us over here on the left in skull morphology in some key areas. One of them is the shape of the brain case. Notice this very oblong shaped brain case versus a much more spherical brain case in modern humans. Notice the difference in the shape of the cheekbones. Homo erectus is said to not have a chin or to not have a prominent chin in the way that, uh, that our species does. Uh, and also note the brow ridge. Notice that there's this, this very steeply sloping for. Uh, this very different sloped forehead as compared to ours uh, that ends in this very, very prominent brow ridge, whereas we have a very not prominent brow ridge. So especially pay attention to this very prominent brow ridge and to this oblong shaped skull. You'll see that, uh, and, and, and this lack of a chin. You'll see those three features showing up uh, several more times throughout this talk. But that's a Homo erectus versus modern humans. A Homo erectus was uh, not, not only looked a lot like us, but they were also very sophisticated. They made sophisticated stone tools. They controlled fire. They hunted a diverse assemblage of game. Uh, they uh, cooked and ate not just wild animals, but a variety of different uh, plant foods, including seeds and nuts that would have been poisonous if not cooked by the skills that they had. So they were, they were, they were a very sophisticated species as well. And from Homo erectus, although not from the specific Homo erectus fossils that we have, originated us, Neanderthals, and some other species that I'm going to talk to you about. So while any particular Homo erectus fossils that we find are not our direct ancestors, the, our species and these others that I talked to you about did arise from Homo erectus. So us, Neanderthals, the other species I'm going to talk to you about were all just strange varieties of Homo erectus, if you want to think about it that way. We're variations on a form and that, and that, and that really important form was Homo erectus. And so let, let me introduce you to us. Meet us, meet Homo sapiens. Uh, we're undoubtedly, uh, in, in, although not existing on the earth as long, uh, we're the most successful hominid species that there's ever been in terms of population size and in, and in terms of our uh, genetic diversity. Uh, we're a very diverse species and of course we're found in all corners of the globe. And we originated as I was indicated to you a little bit earlier in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we evolved from an isolated population of Homo erectus that became differentiated into our species. And this happened uh, sometime uh, around 150,000 years ago, uh, perhaps even um, 100,000 years earlier than that, if, if some fossil sites are to be included. Uh, and then not that long after the origination of our species, we came out of Africa and spread all around the world in different waves at different times through different migration routes, uh, reaching uh, areas of the Pacific Islands a few thousand years ago, uh, reaching the New World uh, a little over 10,000 years ago, uh, reaching different places in Eurasia, 
between 60,000 years ago and uh, 35,000 years ago. And when I say Sub-Saharan Africa, in modern terms, I'm referring to the area of, of Africa that you see here on this satellite image. So this is an actual image of Africa taken from space. And the green that you see there is because those are the areas where there is rainfall. And the green stuff you are seeing is the lush green vegetation. And you'll notice that it stops right about here. Up here is the Saharan Desert. Uh, and you can see the desert uh, ex extending into the Arabian Desert over here. Uh, now, th the Saharan Desert has existed as a barrier to migration for species for, um, for hundreds of thousands of years. But there, there are cycles when the Saharan Desert becomes wetter and corridors are opened up for species to migrate out of Africa. And so while generally a barrier to migration, there have been periods in the history of, uh, of, these, of these cyclical events leading to wetter periods where uh, Homo erectus was able to leave Africa and travel farther uh, and where our species was able to leave Africa and travel farther. And so it was during one of those periods where it was wetter that, we were, that there was a corridor uh, where early modern humans probably following game uh, made their way um, out of Africa and gradually across the rest of the world. And when we made this journey, the, uh, the interesting thing that really makes this talk exciting is that we were not alone. And to explain that a little bit more, uh, I, I have a really interesting metaphor for you. So meet J.R.R. Tolkien, if you're not already familiar with him. He was an English writer, a poet, and scholar. Uh, he was a college professor, and his specialty was uh, Old and Middle English. And he, in fact, published many authoritative works on Old English and Middle English, including a uh, Middle English dictionary that is still in use to this day. But that's not what he's most famous for. He's most famous for uh, one of his little side projects as a popular author, writing some books you may have heard of. Uh, first, The Hobbit in the 1930s, followed up with uh, some, some books that are part of that same storyline uh, known as the Lord of the Ring trilogy that were published in the 1950s. And these books were works of fantasy that were uh, made into very popular blockbuster films in the early 2000s and, and the, as well as the 2010s. And in this fantasy world, humans lived in a place called Middle Earth and they shared Middle Earth with some, with some other creatures, with these human-like creatures that uh, Tolkien called dwarves. Uh, there's humans. Uh, there was another group of human-like creatures that he identified called elves. And then there were uh, still human-like goblins, also known as orcs and trolls, and then the more fantastical creatures like dragons. And then there was this other uh, creature called hobbits that were the, the surprise star of all of the books. Uh, and hobbits were sh very short in stature um, and had things like these hairy feet. Um, and there is a human that we encountered as we were spreading out across the world that is now popularly known as the hobbits. So Tolkien didn't know anything about this group. Uh, he, he, he wrote the novels as pure fantasy, but it's, it's interesting to see how much the world that we encountered um, superficially seemed like the Middle Earth of uh, Tolkien's fantasy. So I'd like to introduce you to the hobbit Homo floresiensis. Homo floresiensis, we know, lived sometime, uh, well, it, traces of it stop at between 50 to 60,000 years ago. Uh, and, it, it, and it lived in the island of Flores in Indonesia, uh, going back as early as uh, 150,000 years ago. And there's traces of human habitation on the island that go back even farther than that. So here we are, we're in, we're in the um, Indonesian archipelago here. We're at the island of Flores. And I'm taking you now to Liang Bao Cave on the island of Flores. And this is where an international archeological team 
searching for about, about human origins. Uh, well, actually they weren't searching about human origins. They were searching about uh, the migration routes of early modern humans of Homo sapiens. So origins in a much more narrow sense, but what they stumbled upon was a, a much more in, interesting story even than about these early human migration routes. And when they stumbled upon these, these fossils, they were very surprised because fossils don't, uh, bones don't, and, and material typically doesn't do well in this climate. This is a warm, humid climate. Uh, and when they stumbled upon these bones, excavating them was a very, very painstaking process because they were not fossilized. They had the consistency of a wet blotting paper uh, is, 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 how, is how sensitive this was. But they managed to excavate some, some remarkably intact uh, fossil specimens from this site, including this one here uh, known as LB1, uh, Ling, uh, Lingua 1. Uh, and uh, we know that this was a, a, based upon the anatomy, was very likely a female. And based upon the size of the skull and the size of the overall body, uh, we know that she was very short, uh, under three feet tall. So here is LB1's skull compared to the skull of, of our species. And so you can see that obviously they're very different in size. Uh, here is one of the anthropologists that was involved in the early work, standing next to an artist's reconstruction of what LB1 uh, may have looked like. So just to give you an idea of, of, how short, uh, of how short she was. And the same with the other fossils of other individuals from this, from this site. Uh, they, they, they were all uh, very diminutive. And going along with that, they had, to, uh, they had small sized stone tools that are consistent with a small bodied peoples. So that, that matches up as well. What we think is that Homo floresiensis was an isolated population of Homo erectus. So remember, we already have Homo erectus pinpointed nearby from those fossils that from the late 19th century uh, from the nearby island of Java. Uh, but it's still interesting because the island of Flores was always separated by water. So however, this original population of Homo erectus made it to the island of uh, Flores, they had to do it on some sort of watercraft, which is just, which is just really stunning. Uh, and, then, and then once there, th this population of Homo erectus became isolated and evolved to, into a different species, evolved to be small bodied. And this is a more general phenomenon seen in biology known as insular dwarfism which is uh, where the species that end up on small islands, if they're large species, they tend to become much smaller. Uh, so for instance, there were also these, uh, these dwarf stegodonts that, were, that coexisted with Homo floresiensis, little uh, miniature um, elephants that wouldn't have been as high as you at the shoulder. Um, there were giant rats. Um, there were giant lizards like Komodo dragons. Um, but then another weird phenomenon of islands is that uh, small species uh, tend to become gigantic. Uh, it, it's insular gigantism. Um, and uh, so there were also these, these rather terrifying looking giant storks. So this was the environment in which Homo floresiensis lived. And Homo floresiensis becoming diminutive is in line with this pattern of larger species evolving to become smaller uh, when they are isolated on islands. Now, here's the question that I teased at the beginning that I'm sure you're wondering about, which is, did we ever meet them? And the answer is a tantalizing maybe. So we don't have any direct evidence that we meet them. But what I can tell you is that at the same cave, evidence of, of Homo sapiens, modern humans, our species starts at about 50,000 years ago in the, in, the, in the sediment layers of this cave. And uh, so I'll tell you now when, when all traces of Homo floresiensis vanish right around 50,000 years ago. So right when modern humans came is right when Homo floresiensis vanished. So that's a pretty interesting coincidence. Um, and it's a pattern that's repeated as, as, as modern humans spread across the globe that it didn't fare well for the other uh, humans that we encountered, I'm sorry to say. But uh, it, it does, but it, 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 while it may be that, we, that there, we had violent conflict with them, we don't know, or it could be that we outcompeted them for food, or it could be uh, coincidental that the same climatic factors that allowed for modern humans to move in uh, had somehow doomed 
uh, Homo floresiensis to extinction at the same time. Um, we're not certain about that, um, but there's that really interesting coincidence there that right when modern humans show up is when um, traces of the hobbit disappear. So there, there's that opportunity that we coexisted with them for a period of time. And in fact, among the, the native Nagay people of the island of Flores, there's a long-standing uh, mythology involving some peoples that live in the forest called the Ebu Gogo. And according to their mythology, the Ebu Gogo are diminutive people under four and a half feet tall uh, that lived in the forest in ancient times and according to their mythology still live in the forest to this day. Um, who would, would mumble to each other in what was assumed to be their own language and who could um, pair it back to you uh, what you said to them. Uh, and, and, and according to their mythology, uh, their ancestors massacred uh, the, the, the Abu Gogo. So is that, is that folk tale that still persists to this day, a, an ancient cultural memory of the time when um, when the, the modern humans living there today, their ancestors encountered uh, Homo floresiensis living on, uh, living on the island of Flores? I don't know, but it's a possibility. Okay, so now I've got an addendum to this part of the talk. So that was as of three years ago, but uh, those of you that are, uh, uh, know a lot about the Lord of the Rings trilogy know that there is in fact more than one type of hobbit, that there are in fact different types of hobbit uh, throughout the novels. And so too with real life. I would like you to meet uh, new as of the last time I gave this talk, Homo luzonensis. I don't have an artist's reconstruction for you because we have very little fossil evidence to go on, but we think it was another uh, quote unquote hobbit, diminutive human species. So now I'm going to take you away from the island of Flores down here uh, to the island of Luzon in the Philippines. Uh, the island of Luzon is a uh, most well known for being the place where the mega city uh, of Manila is located, but up in the north of Luzon uh, is, uh, is um, uh, Kalau Cave. And here is that beautiful cave where, we, we, where some, some, some tantalizing, tantalizing clues uh, are, are offered. Back in the 2010s, some uh, tooth fossils were found in the cave. And uh, they were not under, it was not understood their significance at the time, although the, the distribution of the sizes and the shapes of the teeth uh, was unusual. Along with that was found uh, uh, some phalanges, which are, are uh, some bones in the toes. Interesting thing about this is that these toe bones are curved, whereas in modern humans, the, the, uh, the phalanges are not curved, they're straight. This curvature is a, is a, a relic of tree-dwelling um, ancestors of modern humans that we see earlier uh, in the fossil record. So it's, it's strange that it would have had this, this, this foot architecture. But if you compare the size of the teeth and, and, and the distribution of the shapes of the teeth of Homo luzonensis, uh, the, the closest match is to Homo floresiensis. So we don't think that, that Homo luzonensis was a part of the same metapopulation as, as Homo floresiensis, but rather that the same phenomenon of uh, Homo erectus becoming isolated on the island of Luzon uh, and becoming more diminutive as a part of, in, part of, of insular dwarfism is more likely. That's why it has a different species uh, designation. Also, it has different uh, toe bone, uh, I'm sorry, foot bone architecture than Homo floresiensis. But based upon the similarity in the molars in, in size, for instance, uh, we believe that it was also uh, a small bodied human. So look at this, how small the tooth is here as compared to our species and Homo erectus and Neanderthals. Did we ever meet them? Well, we don't know a lot about Homo luzonensis, but the answer again is maybe. So we, we have evidence of human habitation on the island of Luzon going back 700,000 years, which is well before uh, not only th that our species evolved, um, but say, and then so, so certainly well before we, we migrated out of Africa. 
so it, it must have been Homo erectus or a species that evolved from Homo erectus in situ uh, on the island of Luzon. Uh, but the, but the, but the, but these these fossils that I showed you that I showed you of Homo luzonensis date from about forty thousand. I'm sorry, from about fifty thousand years ago. And when do we find the first evidence of modern humans on the island of Luzon? About fifty thousand years ago. So there's that uh, that that and here's the island of Luzon. Uh, so there's that tight connection again between the arrival of modern humans and the disappearance of of this sister species to modern humans. So, you know, this is another situation where we, where we exterminated them either directly or through competition. Uh, we don't know, but the, the, the coincidence of that timing there where the first record of modern humans on the island of Luzon and the end of uh, the occurrence of anything that we have of Homo luzonensis suggests that um, we, we could have met them, uh, our species could have met them when we first made it to the island of Luzon in the Philippines. It's certainly not out of the question. The timing is just right there at the edge. Okay, moving on. And now I would like you to meet Neanderthals. So here are some artists' reconstructions of what uh, Neanderthals may have looked like based upon the, their uh, fossil remains. We've got really good artists' renditions of what Neanderthals may have looked like. So I'm going to start off my story about Neanderthals <clears throat> by uh, uh, taking you back to the uh, 1850s, where some coal miners in the Neander Valley in Germany happened upon this skull cap fossil where they were doing their coal mining. Now, the fact that this fossil was found in the area where these coal miners were working is coincidental. Um, the, Carbonif the Carboniferous period, which generated the coal, was hundreds of millions of years before Neanderthals. Neanderthals, according to the fossil evidence, lived from uh, around 243,000 years ago to about 40,000 years ago. But uh, anyway, this is the area where the fossils, fossils were found. There would have been um, coal beds there at the same time when the Neanderthals were living. But anyway, this was found in uh, the mid 1850s and the anthropologists of the day quickly recognized that this was not a specimen of modern humans. Notice the shape of the skull cap here as being more oblong. Remember those brow ridges? So we have those Homo erectus like brow ridges there. So they recognized that this was not uh, modern human. Um, all, so while um, ideas about um, evolution were not well articulated yet because Darwin hadn't published his, his, his seminal work on the subject, there was a recognition that this was some sort of uh, a different species of human from us. And it was uh, shortly thereafter connected to some earlier fossil finds in the early 19th century that were made in Belgium and Gibraltar, like, oh yeah, this is the same thing. So then right away, it connected these three groups of fossils together as being a, th this other human species. And since then, we have a lot more Neanderthal fossils uh, and a much better understanding of, of how they relate to modern humans. So Neanderthals have a lot of Homo erectus-like features, but, I, but you can describe them as a, uh, as a uh, stronger, uh, cold-adapted species of human, where they had uh, a lot of those characteristics that I showed you about Homo erectus, uh, as well as a larger rib cage uh, and, and, a, and a thicker bone density. Uh, and, and also they had a larger nasal cavity, uh, much larger nasal cavity than anything you see uh, in, in, in modern human skulls where there's very little variation at all. So this is well outside of the variation in the size of nasal cavities in modern humans. So why would, why would uh, Neanderthals have had such large nasal cavities and why would they have had this, 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 this broad rib cage? and this shorter, stockier build, um, they were adapted to cold areas of Europe. Uh, and, and, and so their, their rib cage architecture allowed their um, lungs to act as a furnace that would heat their bodies. And uh, their larger nasal cavity would allow their larger noses to uh, heat and humidify uh, the cold winter air. So this was a this was a, a shorter species that was that was very that was very strong and robust um, that was adapted to really harsh cold conditions within Europe at the time. 
And uh, here's a comparison of a Neanderthal skull to a modern human skull. You can see that there's a lot of Homo erectus-like features on the skull that we already talked about. Look at that brow ridge again. Look at the shape of that skull again. Look at the absence of that chin. We think that uh, Neanderthals evolved as an isolated population of Homo erectus. So as Homo erectus spread throughout Eurasia, populations of Homo erectus became isolated from the rest of the Homo erectus species within Europe by uh, climatic and geographic factors. And then in that area, they evolved to become a different species that was more strictly cold adapted. And, and adapted to hunting, a strong species adapted to hunting big game. Because of these robust features of Neanderthal skeletons, early depictions of Neanderthals, this one's from the early 20th century in France, uh, based upon a, a Neanderthal find in France, uh, they were pr predicted to be uh, very much not like us, very quote unquote ape-like and brutish, um, like this very ape-like uh, Neanderthal represented here. And that, and that idea has persisted even uh, into uh, the 20th and the 21st century that Neanderthals were, were quote unquote primitive, which isn't the case. They were a sister species to humans. They were another species of humans, but still we have representations like this for, from this uh, great B movie poster from the 1960s. But uh, Neanderthals made very elegant, sophisticated stone tools. Uh, they, they, they controlled fire. They hunted all sorts of, of big game that, was, that required a lot of skill and coordination and bravery. Uh, they, they cooked and ate all sorts of plant foods. They, they made symbolic art. They buried their dead um, with, with um, potentially with even with, with, with funerary rites. They created, we now know some cave art. So uh, these, these were not uh, an, an unsophisticated or brutish people at all. They were very, very fascinating and, and very human uh, and very sophisticated. And, and th they, lived, they lived in, in harsh conditions in Europe for, for a very, very long time. So here's a much more sympathetic modern representation of Neanderthals. This is from a Neanderthal museum in Croatia near uh, some significant uh, Neanderthal fossil sites within, within that country. So look at how human this site look, uh, this, this diorama looks. Look at how human these, these people look. And even though they're, what they're depicting here are Neanderthals. So this is, a, this is a much more sympathetic depiction of what Neanderthals would have looked like. And we can, we, we can imagine ourselves in that scene and relating to these people. I want to draw your attention to this individual here. This is based upon a real fossil find of a severely disabled uh, Neanderthal man who lived to the ripe old age of 40, which was almost unheard of in the, in the fossil record at that time. And uh, based upon uh, severe damages to his skull, um, it, it, it's, it's thought that he was blind in one eye and had and, and damages to his ear canal that he was probably very hearing impaired. Um, and uh, uh, he was missing a hand. And yet, and these injuries were all very old and he lived to a ripe old age so that Neanderthals cared for one another. So they were a lot like you and me. And, and here, it, here, here's another very sympathetic portrait of Neanderthals taken from the Neanderthal Museum in Germany near the Neander Valley, uh, showing what a, what a Neanderthal would look like if he was cleaned up and wearing a business suit and clean shaven. So while he, he looks a little different from the, you and me, um, he still looks like a human being. And as a nod to uh, him being a Neanderthal, they have a, one of the, a, a stone tool represented, representative of the type that Neanderthals have in his hand. But otherwise, you can see that uh, you know, he looks kind of like you and me. So Neanderthals, you've heard about them before. You've learned some more about them today. Did we ever meet them? And the answer is definitely. So to paint that picture for you, I'm going to take you to Northern Israel, to the Galilee region, to a series of caves in that area, which is an imp important part of the story of human origins. So this is a uh, skull cap fossil of a, of, a, of a modern human specimen dating to about 55,000 years ago from that area of, of Israel. And these, are, uh, th well, this here is one of the fossils that was found of Neanderthals 
dating from that same time period from a neighboring cave. So we, we know that modern humans and Neanderthals were living together in the same area uh, of, of, of the Galilee region, occupying neighboring caves to one another. And we have some fossil skulls that appear to have intermediate morphology in between Neanderthals and modern humans. So there's kind of oblong, but kind of spherical. Other aspects of the, uh, of the skulls are, are some human, some Neanderthal. So we think that these may represent hybrids. So that's, that's a pretty strong piece of evidence that, you know, that we met Neanderthals uh, and had babies with them. But the real uh, way that we nailed down the story was through advances in our understanding of DNA and DNA technology. So uh, DNA is the building blocks of cells. I, it, well, DNA contains the instructions, the blueprint for cells to do everything that cells do, for cells to make everything that cells make, for development from uh, an embryo to an adult body is all contained within the instructions of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And I'm sure you've seen many crime shows and uh, heard of many court cases where DNA was used to solve crimes because the, the language of the DNA code is different for every single person because the instructions uh, written into our DNA are different from ev for every single person on earth and for every single creature on earth. And so that you can identify who did a crime by the genetic fingerprint of some uh, human fluid or um, something that was left at the scene. So like that, but, but for Neanderthals. So people have been able in the last decade to get DNA from Neanderthal fossils. Neanderthals lived in cold regions of Europe. Uh, and the fossils are often well-preserved uh, because of the climatic conditions where the fossils were found and advances in, in getting old DNA out of bones has meant uh, that uh, the full genetic profile of multiple Neanderthal individuals is now, is now uh, unlocked. We now have the full DNA code of multiple Neanderthal individuals. And so we've been able to compare the code of, Neand of these Neanderthal individuals to modern day humans and see the telltale signature of Neanderthals and modern humans. So we know that out our ancestors not only encountered um, Neanderthals, um, were intimate with Neanderthals, had babies with them that were that we included as members of our human family, uh, and then went on to leave descendants. So the percentage of Neanderthal DNA in modern humans uh, is uh, somewhere around uh, one to two percent generally. Uh, lower in some areas than others. Um, it's mostly found in, in people of non-Sub-Saharan African origin uh, because modern humans encountered, first evolved in Sub-Saharan Africa and then encountered Neanderthals who had evolved in Europe only after that they had left Sub-Saharan Africa. So you and I are all a, a, a tiny part ne a Neanderthal not because of direct Neanderthal ancestry for the bulk of our ancestors, but because there, was the, there were these events where we know that they met because there was at least one Neanderthal, um, probably one or two, probably more, probably more like one to three Neanderthal ancestors uh, that uh, contributed to the modern human gene pool. So you and I were all part Neanderthal. So we know that we met them. And this here is a jawbone of a modern human, our species from a cave in Romania from about 40,000 years ago. And uh, the full genetic code has been obtained from this specimen. And uh, we know now that this specimen um, had a Neanderthal great great grandparent or something or something within that range great great or great 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 grandparent based upon the amount of neanderthal dna uh, in this individual's uh, dna code so we almost caught it in the act there we almost caught 
the interbreeding of modern humans uh, and Neanderthals in the act here with this, with this jawbone specimen. And if we look at our, at our genome, our complete DNA profile, we can see that there are many genes where we've inherited variants of those genes from Neanderthals. And those genes have certain functions um, that, that we see in modern humans. They have a lot to do with the way that our immune system operates, as well as having to do with the pigmentation of our skin and of our hair. So that's Neanderthals. But it wasn't just Neanderthals that were out there in Eurasia. I'd like to introduce you to the Denisovans. And for that, I'm going to take you to Denisova Cave in Siberia in Russia, in the far reaches of Siberia in Russia. And it is in this cave in the 2010s when a bunch of different specimens from that cave were being uh, analyzed uh, and, their, and their DNA codes were being unlocked, uh, that some curious specimens were found, such as this weird large molar and part of a finger bone and other small specimens like that. And all of the specimens that were found in that cave tended to be really chewed up and contaminated with, uh, with, uh, with cave hyena. Uh, and so the idea is that um, not only were um, different humans living in this cave, but that cave hyenas were also living in the cave at different times. And um, they, they, they may have eaten some of these, um, some humans, uh, and, and pooped out little pieces of their remains within this cave. But anyway, so we had these, these small specimens there and they were being, their, their sequences were being analyzed. It was assumed that they were Neanderthal. The study was involving Neanderthals and how far they were found out east and if they, and if they reached that far. But uh, the, the thing that was discovered by DNA analysis was that this represented an entirely different human species that um, was split from Neanderthals by several hundred thousand years and split from us, modern humans, by several hundred thousand years more. So they were, they were by just the DNA and those tantalizing clues, we were able to find that this was a species, while we knew very little about it, that was genetically very distinct from anything that we'd ever seen before, or heard of before. Nobody had any, nobody was even looking for this species. It was just thought there was Neanderthals out there. But now we know that there were these Denisovans. And we definitely met them. So this is a map of, and, and, and these dots represent uh, DNA samples that were collected from individual people that are alive today, where their DNA was, was compared to these Denisovan specimens to see if there was any um, similarities. And what they found was that peoples that live in Southeast Asia primarily, uh, and in um, the island of New Guinea, the Papuans especially, as well as Aboriginal peoples and Polynesian peoples uh, contain measurable amounts of De Denisovan DNA, which is really fascinating because Denisova cave is all the way up here in Siberia, but we see the traces of Denisovan DNA in modern day humans all the way down here in Southeast Asia and, and, and throughout um, the Pacific which suggests that Denisovans ranged all the way from Siberia down into Southeast Asia and that it was during uh, the human migrations into Southeast Asia on the southerly route that we encountered Denisovan populations down there. And actually uh, Papuans apparently encountered yet another group of uh, Denisovans during their migrations to the island of New Guinea. So Papuans cont uh, are, contain even more Denisovan DNA um, up to about 6%. And uh, we can look at, at, at modern human uh, DNA profiles and we can find genes that the variants were inherited from Denisovans. And we can see that those genes uh, have important functions for modern day humans. One really interesting example is, uh, is, a, is a gene variant that was inherited from uh, this breeding event with Denisovans um, that is found in modern day Tibetans. So Tibetans don't have a lot of Denisovan DNA, but they, but they almost all have this particular variant that they inherited from uh, Denisovans that helps them to survive in low oxygen environments. So Tibet is at a very high altitude where there's less oxygen in the air. And Tibetan people are actually constitutively adapted 
to better handle in their blood uh, the lower oxygen environment, uh, in part because of this gene variant that they inherited from Denisovans, which gives us a clue that Denisovans were also uh, very cold adapted. So while they ranged all the way down into Southeast Asia, you know, we did find them up in this cave in Siberia, and they're associated with this adaptation to cold environments in Tibet. So that was 2018. So now I've got some exciting updates for you. The Denisovans are taking shape. So this is an artist's rendition of what Denisovans may have looked like. This is an artist's rendition specifically of the uh, girl whose finger bone I, was, I showed you in an earlier slide and had her whole DNA profile sequenced. Uh, a, a, an international team of computational biologists made predictions about what she should have looked like based upon the patterns of regulatory elements in the DNA code of her genome. And this was an artist's rendition of what she would have looked like. And it, they went further than that. They actually made a bunch of predictions about the entire skeletal morphology just based upon the DNA. So here for comparison is a modern human on the left. Here on the right is a uh, Neanderthal. And then this is the predictions about what Denisovans would have looked like. So the bottom line is that Denisovans looked pretty Neanderthal-like, except with an even flatter, flatter, stronger, uh, bigger jaw and a, and a flatter face uh, and a, an even thicker bone density. So they were a, a, a stronger, even more robust form of, of Neanderthal, uh, if you want to think about it that way. Although they were, they were very, very uh, de de split evolutionarily. Uh, from Neanderthals. They, 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 Neanderthals and Denisovans, you know, shared a most recent common ancestor uh, hundreds of thousands of years uh, ago. And so we had these predictions about what Denisovans should look like, that they were these, you know, robust Homo erectus type. And now we have uh, some more data to put to bear on that. So this is a piece of the uh, parietal part of the skull in the back. A uh, small fragment, but the shape of it is consistent with a more oblong shape that you would find uh, in Neanderthals and that was predicted for Denisovans. And I, now I'm going to take you uh, uh, to uh, uh, Bai Shia Karst Cave in China for the next update that I have for you. Uh, this cave has uh, for many centuries been a Buddhist shrine. It's a, it's a holy uh, site for Buddhists. And back in 1980, a Buddhist monk who was in there meditating uh, came upon this jawbone, this, this fragment of the mandible. Uh, and it, 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 this was, it, its, its significance wasn't appreciated at the time, uh, except that the teeth were weird. It had these large, weird looking molars in it. But it was given a fresh look in the 2010s. And this is, and this is a reconstruction uh, in, in, a, in a very recent study of what that jawbone would look like if we had the other piece of it. And so this morphology is consistent with the, uh, with the broader, uh, stronger jaw features uh, that were predicted for a Denisovan. And, the, and the, the lack of the chin is also evident. And we know that this was a Denisovan because while it was not possible to extract DNA, to get usable DNA out of, this, out of this jawbone, it was possible to get proteins. And the protein uh, profile was compared against the protein profile for Denisovans, modern humans, uh, and Neanderthals. And it matched the uh, protein profile for Denisovans. So there's, and, and by the way, this jawbone uh, fragment dates back 160,000 years. So that provided some strong evidence that Denisovans were living uh, in, 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 in the Baishia Karst cave area 160,000 years ago in this high altitude environment, this harsh high altitude environment. By the way, the, 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 the Baishia Karst cave is located in Tibet. So remember Tibet from earlier, I was talking about how we can still see the DNA from Denisovans in modern Tibetans. So that links up too. Based upon that tantalizing clue, an international team of researchers went to Baishia Karst Cave and excavated it, uh, looking for uh, human remains, including Denisovan remains, as well as taking some soil samples to see if they could 
find the DNA of Denisovans just in the environment. It's a new technology called eDNA, where even trace amounts of DNA that are left in the soil um, from, from human activities could be picked up and we could get uh, genetic profiles. This work had to be conducted uh, during the late night hours uh, after careful negotiation with the Buddhist monks who run the site so as not to interfere uh, with, their, um, with their religious activities. Sure enough, they found uh, uh, Denisovan DNA, full genetic sequences of the mitochondrial DNA within, within strata going back over 100,000 years and up until about 50,000 years ago in the Baishia Karst cave. So we know, that the, we know that the Denisovans were there. We know that they were there. One more cool piece to this story. Uh, so this is either from an arm or a leg bone of a girl that was estimated to be about 13 years old and our, um, archeologists and geneticists have nicknamed her Denny. I say her because we've uh, managed to get a really good uh, DNA profile of her full DNA uh, composition. And it turns out that she is exactly one half Neanderthal and one half Denisovan. She had a Denisovan father and a Neanderthal mother. And by the way, these bone fragments were newly um, excavated uh, from Denisova cave in Siberia. So we've actually found evidence that not only did the Denisovans meet our species, but we can, we've actually caught the act of Denisovans and Neanderthals meeting in the act. Uh, this is as strong an evidence as you can find that, that these different human species were interacting with one another. And based upon what we now know about what Neanderthals look like and what we think Denisovans look like, and based upon the specific genetic code of Denny, uh, uh, this is an artist's rendition of what Denny may have looked like. Half Denisovan, half Neanderthal hybrid found in Denisova cave. Okay, one more thing. Uh, I want to introduce you to a mysterious group called the Red Deer Cave People, I, which who we don't know a lot about. Uh, their remains have been found in two caves in China, in, Lo in Longlin and Maladong, which are two areas that are separated by about 500, by about, I'm sorry, by about 500 miles. And separately in those two caves, the, the, these, these same types of fossils have been found of the same uh, human, I don't know what to call it, human species, modern humans, we're not really sure. Uh, the, the, the morphology of the fossil specimens is a mishmash of modern human and um, features that we would expect to see in Denisovans. So is, is this just some strange group of modern humans? Was this a Denisovan human mixed group? We don't know. We haven't been able to get DNA out of these fossils. But what I can tell you is, is that the dating has put the age of these fossils at between 11 and 14 and a half thousand years ago, which is much more recent than the other finds I've told you about. So the idea that this sister group, potentially a sister group to humans, maybe um, Denisovans or some Denisovan like group, uh, persisted. Um, up until about 11,000 years ago is just mind boggling. I mean, that, that already uh, our species uh, had developed agriculture and had domesticated the dog. And yet th there could have been uh, some remnant populations of some of our sister species that were still alive at that time. So in summary, uh, evolution doesn't work like a ladder. It works like a, a bush where the, the fossils that we find are sister species to us that we never find, we're very unlikely to find the fossils of our direct ancestors. We're much more likely to find the fossils of side branches. And when modern humans made their way across the world, we weren't alone and we encountered uh, some really interesting other uh, species that were still clearly human that shared our, our common humanity and that we could have related to very easily uh, but, we're, but we're nonetheless uh, distinct, uh, separately evolved um, species from us. That seemed a, a lot like uh, the Middle Earth that was imagined by, uh, by, Jake, by J.K. Rowling um, almost uh, 90 years ago. So with that, um, I thank everyone and I'm happy to take your questions.
So can you speculate on what the future of human evolu evolution is shaping up to be? So um, humans are still evolving. Um, and there, there, there are some reasons that I, I could explain that uh, as a population geneticist. Um, we don't have an infinite population size, so I can tell you for sure that we're evolving. But in, in modern times, the, 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 the scale of our evolution is likely very diminished. And I say that because of modern technology and because the interconnectedness of different human populations across the world. Uh, the, 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 so the interconnectedness of human populations um, means that we're not as isolated from one another. And evolution works easiest in small isolated populations. And when you have a much larger meta population of interconnected individuals, like in the modern world, uh, there's less opportunity for uh, local adaptation and um, regional differences to evolve. So uh, the fact that we all travel um, and um, find love partners from different places all over the world uh, has a tendency to um, homogenize the gene pool uh, and, act and act against um, separately evolving populations. And also technology, modern technology, especially medical technology, means that um, the, the selection pressures that would have killed humans um, in pre-industrial times no longer, you know, are often now survivable because, so that's another way in which the, the, the selection on um, humans is likely much less than it was in earlier times. But, but that said, we, we are still evolving in, in smaller, more minor ways. Thank you. Hello. Hi there. Um, so I had a question about um, Neanderthals and especially, yeah, specifically about Neanderthals. So uh, I've been reading about Neanderthals and their physiology being a lot, um, of having like a higher body mass and usually being a lot more individual and more creative or like more, uh, it's been like linked that they were like uh, a smarter in, uh, species. Um, so how were, were humans ever like in combat with them or was it just that um, as climate changed, um, we were better adapted to our environment to them. And that's why we don't see the prevalence of pure Neanderthals or Neanderthal hybrids. So th 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 those are some really good questions. We don't know why, for sure, why uh, Neanderthals went extinct. Uh, and, and so addressing your, your first question, which is, was there direct combat? We don't, we don't know. There's some fossil evidence that some people have interpreted as evidence of combat. There's uh, some Neanderthal remains, you know, fossilized remains that are interpreted as um, some arrow marks on a rib cage, which was a technology that only modern humans used and not, and not Neanderthals. So if you agree with that interpretation of the mark on the rib cage, then maybe that was, you know, a, a Neanderthal felled by a by a modern human with a bow and arrow, but and then and then there's there's been some uh, human remains that have been suggested to be done by thrusting spears, which would have been used by Neanderthals. But that's not that's not agreed upon um, by the anthropological community. That's that's in dispute. So we don't have really strong evidence of um, combat. But I mean, I I think there's a strong circumstantial case that wherever modern humans went around the globe, that something very bad happened to the other human species uh, that were there. Whereas, you know, we, we, whereas we likely coexisted with Neanderthals for thousands of years, thousands of years is a flash in the pan, you know, in terms of the whole lifespan of the, of the Neanderthal species. Uh, so now, is it that um, Neanderthals went extinct be, because of ferocious combat that they were just not as good at? Or is it um, that modern humans were just better at hunting for food, and so that you know, we kind of starved the Neanderthal, Neanderthals to extinction, I'm sorry to say, by outcompeting them or relegating them to poor habitat as they tried to stay away from us. Uh, we don't know, but the Neanderthal species was under a lot of stress at the time when, when, when modern humans came in. 
So some of the same climatic conditions that opened up this corridor for modern humans to come into Europe were climatic conditions that were putting Neanderthals under a lot of stress. There were periods of, of warmer conditions uh, and, and periods of, of tremendously cold conditions that even for the cold adapted Neanderthals were, were, would have been hard to endure and they went back and forth like that in, in Europe. And so that uh, the Neanderthal population sizes were already small because of all of those stresses. And Neanderthal populations were always small. They always tended to live in small family groups that were isolated from one another, which means that genetically, Neanderthals were just not very diverse, which is another stress um, because not having a diverse gene pool uh, leads to more um, problems with, with, with having children and with having children that survive to, to maturity. Um, so, you know, there, it was like a perfect storm for Neanderthals at the time when modern humans came on the scene. But it's hard for me to imagine, given this repeated pattern of humans, of other human species going extinct as soon as modern humans are on the scene, to not believe that there wasn't a direct effect of modern humans coming on the scene uh, that just wiped them out. Dr. Benta, we have a question from the chat uh, from a Max Nash that says, I haven't heard the term Cro-Magnon man mentioned tonight. Where do they fit in? Oh, so, so uh, Cro-Magnon man uh, is a specimen of modern humans uh, from the Cro-Magnon region in France. Um, and so they, they, so they, were, they were modern humans. Um, I, I think the Cro-Magnon man was around 30 or 40,000 years ago, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, so it, one of the earliest specimens of modern humans uh, from, that, from that initial wave of modern humans uh, into Europe. So, that, th so that's how they fit in. They were, they, were modern, they were modern humans. They were our species. Uh, yes, I had actually, there was like two questions regarding the, you said the two species of hobbits that went extinct upon the arrival of the Homo sapiens. Is it possible that the Homo sapiens actually hunted them given like similar uh, behaviors of modern day humans um, pushing species to the edge of extinction or extinction because of hunting since they were such a smaller species, is that possible? I, I think it's absolutely possible. Yeah, I, I agree, it's completely possible. We just don't have, we don't have direct evidence. I mean, the only thing I can tell you for sure is that it, like I said in the talk, that at the same time where modern humans came on the scene in those layers of the cave, there's not a trace of, um, of, of, of hobbits anymore. We don't find any of their little stone tools, none of their, none of their fossil remains, none of the, uh, the, the evidence of their stone tools butchering, you know, little stone tool butcher marks on, on, um, on animal carcasses. It's all modern humans. So, you know, we just, we just don't have any of that evidence to really nail down um, if it was if it was violent confronta confrontation that drove, for instance, the Hobbit to extinction, maybe when I give this talk again in three more years, uh, that'll be one of the cool updates um, th that that I'll be able to share with you. But right now, we just we don't have that kind of direct evidence. We just have uh, hypotheses that are that are just circumstantial, based upon the quick, um, no, not seeing it anymore in the fossil record of all of these different human species as soon as modern humans are on the scene. Okay, and then the other thing that I just wanted to ask you real quick, I know there's a lot of other people with questions. Are you familiar with Dr. Dennis McKenna and Terence McKenna's um, hypothesis about the stone ape hypothesis uh, regarding the explanation for the nature to brain body relationship of the, logarith the log logarithmic expectations um, compared to other mammals? Is it true that, that humans actually had a faster uh, cerebral evolution as far as neural tissue than other mammals. And if that was true, is it possible that the stone ape hypothesis could be relevant in regarding the psilocybin causing neurogenesis and advancing that neural tissue in the species as they were migrating out? Uh, so, so, so did you mention psilocybin in there? Um, the, um, did I hear that right? Or I, I, help me to hear, you could repeat the last part again. Okay, well, um, so re regarding the overall question, um, 
uh, hominins in general have very large brains. We have large, very energetic, energetically expensive brains. And that's true uh, with all the members of our species, whether it's Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, uh, uh, Homo, Homo neanderthalensis, Denisovans. We're all very large brain species. Um, you know, very intelligent, very creative, um, that have to eat a lot of calories just to run those run those brains all the time. It's, it's, very, yes. it's very expensive. Oh, sorry. And then to answer your question, I did mention the psilocybin because that was a part of Dr. Dennis McKenna and Terrence McKenna's um, stone date hypothesis was that the psilocybin specifically, since it does have neurogenesis effects, um, that it could have potentially attributed to the increase in neural tissue um, gradually or they were, it was unclear if it was associated with the, the hybridization, like you mentioned with the Neanderthals, um, basically becoming a hybrid with the Homo sapiens um, interbreeding with them. So, okay, so, 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 that, okay, so I think I get it now. You said stoned ape. I thought, I thought you said stone ape. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm not familiar with that idea. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't know enough about their um, hypothesis. Um, the fi you know the finer points of it really to comment on it. Um, I, you know, I don't know of any any evidence of how far back in time usage of hallucinogens goes. So I, I don't I don't have a lot to offer on that on that hypothesis except to say that um, um, all all hominids are very large brained. Sorry, I don't have more to offer on that. Hey, um, my question is, do you think humans just outbred our competitors? Yeah, so that's another idea that's, uh, that's put forth and it's a, it's, a, it's a variation on this idea of um, it was that of it being intense competition that drove other species to extinction when humans came on the scene. So according to that hypothesis, while we know that we did meet each other because uh, for example, in the case of Neanderthals or Denisovans, because we see um, small amounts of their DNA existing in us today. Uh, the, the general idea there is that by and large, for instance, humans and modern humans and Neanderthals stayed away from each other um, and tried to um, go, you know, be in different areas where the other one wouldn't be hunting so that they wouldn't have any conflicts with one another. Um, and, and, and so by that idea, there wasn't war that, for instance, drove Neanderthals to extinction. It was, it was just that humans were much more efficient hunters. And, and, uh, and, and so that uh, they were basically eating all the food and there was nothing left for Neanderthals. And, and of course that translates into having more babies. Uh, and so if you have one species that is taking all the resources and turning it into babies and the other uh, human species that isn't able to get enough to eat and isn't able to have as many offspring, um, then that you'd see the same pattern as you would with warfare, uh, except over a, potentially a longer period of time, although not necessarily. Um, you know, if the difference in competitive advantage was great enough, I mean, Neanderthals could have gone like that. Mm -hmm. and, and Neanderthals did have a higher caloric need. So stealing their food would have had a, a bad impact on Neanderthals because they had to eat a lot to maintain, to maintain their, 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 more than modern humans did. And, um, you know, and then they had off, you know, babies are expensive and uh, babies with big brains are expensive and just and, and need a lot of food on top of that, top of their base caloric requirements. So that, that's another live possibility about, about what happened to uh, other human species like Neanderthals. Well, you kind of answered my question when you answered uh, the other people's questions about how um, Neanderthals having such a, uh, such a higher caloric input as compared to humans because of their increased mass, uh, mass size and larger brain size. And that was one of those things I was gonna talk about is that um, there was the, the hypothesis that they would be able to outcompete um, Neanderthals because, or we, modern humans were able to compete um, Neanderthals because they were much more efficient in terms of energy use and forge for other things that Neanderthals couldn't because of their size. Yeah, so one of the things, what, one of the things that um, our archaeologists, many have hypothesized based upon the fossil record, is that uh, if, if we were to meet a Neanderthal today, you know, we would recognize them as quintessentially human and, and like us, but um, that they would also stand out as being um, um, very um, strict about the way that they did things. 
so that we don't see a lot of changes in their stone tool technology through time. They used the same kind of stone tools um, throughout a long period of throughout, throughout the majority of their of their um, existence, and they only used thrusting spears. So whenever they came upon an animal, they had to be right up there next to the woolly mammoth and be stabbing it directly with a spear, which was very dangerous. And in fact, Neanderthal fo uh, fossil remains are just littered with all kinds of scars from being torn up from in these battles, trying to spear these animals to death. Whereas modern humans were very innovative. And, and uh, you know, the, the um, archeological findings associated with modern humans are very diverse and represent new, new stone tool technologies and, and um, much more elaborate creative artwork. Um, and um, importantly, uh, new and constantly evolving hunting technologies, such as uh, throwing spears, where you didn't have to be right up against the animal anymore, and which, by the way, would also be a huge advantage in warfare, uh, and also bow and arrows. Um, so the, the modern humans, uh, the, the record indicates that they were a lot more innovative um, than, than, than Neanderthals. So there, there could have been some sort of a really ingrained cultural element there that, um, that just disadvantaged them against the much more uh, innovative uh, modern humans that they encountered, either directly or because it just, it, it was one of the other things that just led to them being decimated in the competition for food. Yes, sir. I would like to ask you a question. You said that the Neanderthals and the Devonshires were only in Euro European, Asian, Euro-Asian DNAs. Is that what you yes. said? Well, well uh, uh, actually, it's all, all people in the world except for Sub-Saharan African, people of Sub-Saharan African origin. Although that's not entirely true, we do see traces of it, small traces of it in people of Sub-Saharan African origin, uh, have Neanderthal ancestry. Okay, because uh, when, yeah. when I did my, you know, 23andMe testing or Ancestry.com testing, uh, it shows Neanderthal and Devonshire with, you know, like 3% and 1% respectively. Oh, so, so okay, so it shows Denisov in there too. Yeah, it shows Division in there too. And that was recently, well, the Neanderthal was five years ago when I did the testing. It showed up the division and was a whole lot more frequent, more so sooner that they had added that to my DNA testing. But yeah, that shows up in the when you do the the HAP groups, remember. The DNA testing that started out with National Geographic and their great trail of, of humans through the world. And it mm -hmm. was one of the HAP groups that they found. Oh, that's well, 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 well that's interesting. Um, most, so to, there are small amounts of Denisovan DNA um, that are present in uh, Native American populations. So, there is trace amounts of Denisovan DNA in other peoples uh, throughout the world. So people that have uh, some Native American heritage, for instance, you can find trace amounts of Denisovan uh, there as well. But you don't find Denisovan DNA as widespread among the uh, human population outside of Sub-Saharan Africa as you do Neanderthal DNA. Although there are some parts of the world where people have a lot of Denisovan DNA, such as the people in the island of New Guinea, the Papuans in the island of New, New Guinea can, can be up to uh, six or 7% Denisovan. And then on top of that, they can be another, you know, 2% of, of, of Neanderthal ancestry, which is really amazing. But, uh, but in other places in the world, um, uh, people have uh, typically have very, very low or undetectable percentages of Denisovan ancestry. So it's much spottier. Just like the fossil record with Denisovans is much, much spottier, um, the um, Denisovan heritage in modern humans is much spottier. We have time for one final question, Dr. Bent. Hi. So Hi there. Uh, you mentioned earlier in the talk about the folklore that talked about how they like uh, slaughtered the hobbits. 
And I was wondering if there were any more instances of folklore that said stuff like that. So that's a really great question. What I forgot to mention with Homo Luzonensis is that there's, a, there's an analogous folklore um, on the island of Luzon. Um, it's, not, it's not as impressive in the sense that Luzon is a very, very populous island. I mean, it's got the, you know, the mega, what, 20 million or 30 million population city of Manila on it. So there's a lot of folklore there, but there is, there is folklore um, among, among groups there that, that's similar to the Ebu Gogo. Um, so that, that lines up. Um, but you know, do, is that just a coincidence, um, or is it, or is it a really ar archaic memory of this time of overlap? We don't know. Um, I mean, there's there's folk there's other kinds of folklore all over the world. Um, you know, there's leprechauns in Ireland and all sorts of mythical f forest creatures um, in, in in mythology in different places in the world. Um, uh, uh, most of it is probably just um, doesn't have any tracing back to uh, this time in our distant past, 50,000 years ago when we overlapped with these other human species. Um, but some of it could. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting idea uh, to think about. All right, Josh, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. And 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 thank and thank you, uh, uh, Tom, and 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 the rest of the uh, organizers, and uh, thank you all uh, in the audience for 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 joining us. I hope you'll I hope you'll stay tuned and and join us again for what we plan for next year. Yes, yes, and I also want to remind everyone that tonight's talk was recorded, and it will be available to watch later. And you'll be able to find the link at the Darwin Day Tyler website, which is darwindaytyler.org. And then this marks the end of Darwin Day 2021. So thank you to the sponsors. Thank you to the hosts and everyone for participating. Have a great rest of your day and a good night, everyone. Thank you.